So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our third and final class of the Chronic Kidney Disease class series led by Elena Zidaru, um, Community Health Resource Center's registered dietitian. Um, we are very happy that you are joining us today. Today is going to be focused on meal planning around chronic kidney disease, whether you are eating out or cooking for yourself. My name is Twin. I am the program coordinator for Community Health Resource Center. We are a nonprofit that's been around for over 30 years here in the San Francisco Bay Area. We provide four areas of services, uh, nutrition counseling, mental health services, health screenings, and health education, which you are part of right now. Um, all of our health education has now moved to virtual execution. So it, hopefully it makes it very accessible to everyone. This, uh, this session is also recorded so that uh, after our session, I will send the edited video link out and you can share it with your friends and family. Um, now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our sponsors, National Kidney Foundation. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so this is just a summary of our services. That's my web, that's my email, and that's our website, chrcsf.org. And Colleen, why don't you take it away? All right, that requires unmuting. Okay, so this is actually the first time I'm presenting uh, nationally uh, as a sponsor. So um, thank you guys so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm Colleen Fisher. I am the Senior Development Manager uh, in with the National Kidney Foundation San Francisco office, which represents Northern California, Oregon, and Washington. So it's really a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, we, uh, the National Kidney Foundation is focused on helping all those with kidney disease in all of its various forms uh, live their best life possible. So we do that through education, engagement, all sorts of various opportunities, sponsoring programs like you're watching today and you have been for the last several weeks. Um, we know that advocacy and awareness comes from education and doing everything that you can to uh, figure out what's going to be best for you in your life with kidney disease. So uh, whether that's learning for you or a loved one, just know that the Kidney Foundation, National Kidney Foundation is always here for you to answer questions and to help you find and source all of the things that you need um, to live that life as, as well as can be expected. Um, so next slide. Uh, so the three major opportunities that we want to let you guys know about is NKF Cares, which is our helpline. Um, so you'll see the phone number there, 855-NKF-CARES, or you can certainly use that email address. Uh, with COVID and everything being virtual, uh, our team there is poised to help you answer any and all questions that they can or certainly drive you to local resources. Um, you can also always search for our local chapter um, and any of our staff. Doris is usually the one who will answer the phone. She's amazing. Um, and um, But Patty and Celine also have a remarkable source of programs and resources um, that we can help share with you if you need them um, for our for our territory um, we do have our peers program so if you're feeling like you need a little more assistance or a little more engagement from somebody who has uh, walked the path that you are you are on um, our peers program is a great opportunity for that to engage with them and to feel like you have a mentor and a guide uh, to again have those more personal one-on-one -on -one conversations with um, and then we also always have our online community so there's various blogs and posts and things where you can see people who are asking the same questions that you are and have the same concerns that you do and have answers from various um, staffers and researchers within the kidney community, whether that be dietitians or physicians or nurses or any of the other incredible people that um, help get answers to make your life possible. So we love to share those opportunities with you if you need them. And then here's what I do for a living. <laughs> 
So I head up our kidney walk program here in Northern California. And uh, so wanted to let you guys know about the opportunities that we have coming up on November 8th. Um, all of the work that we do simply cannot happen without the support of our incredible community. So um, these events are fundraisers, but there's no barrier to entry. There's no cost to participate for you or your friends and family. And really at the end of the day, this year more than any other year, it is about getting as many people as we possibly can to these events. They are gonna be virtual. We're gonna encourage you to walk from your homes and neighborhoods this year. So there's no need to come to a central place to feel like you'll be putting your health or your safety and security at risk in order to, to be there and to walk and to feel a part of this greater community. In fact, that's where Lace Up comes from. It's about getting ready and lacing up and putting on your sneakers. And the way I like to talk about it is it's the way we tie ourselves together as a kidney community. So it's a great opportunity for you to learn more about us and to have your friends and family help you and figure out how best to help you. I know a lot of questions we get is, well, how do we help? What do you need us to do for you? And sometimes you don't need them to do anything now, but this is a way that they can absolutely get involved and feel 100% committed to you and the things that are important to you and support the organization that supports you. So we would absolutely welcome you to join us. Again, there's no cost. Um, you can go to kidneywalk.org and you'll see our four sites. The sites are something that we do every year because we typically have a physical walk. So I would say just pick the closest one to you. Um, there's not going to be any physical on-site events this year. We'll be doing a virtual opening ceremonies that will be live streamed in conjunction with our office in New York. So it'll be just a really fantastic day for you to get involved, catch us online, and then get the strollers, get the dogs, get the kids, get your grandkids, get everybody out, wear your masks, and uh, join us out in the community and raise awareness for kidney disease. So uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them into the chat or the Q&A box because I will be here for the next little bit listening and learning with all of you. And uh, we really look forward to having you this year. I'm your boots on the ground. You're my Gail Friday when it comes to the walk. So if at any point you do decide you want to get engaged, all you need to do is reach out and I will be more than happy to help you with anything that you need. So now let's get on with the education and thanks everybody and have a great day. Thank you so much, Colleen. What a wonderful way to get involved and such resilience on rolling through the pandemic and still getting the awareness. Uh, thanks again, Colleen, and thanks, Patty. So without further delay, Elena will share her screen and uh, we'll get started with the lecture today. And at the end of this presentation, there'll be a very brief quiz. So make sure you stay for the rest of the, um, make sure you stay for the whole presentation. Thank you. Hi, um, welcome back for our third class uh, on nutrition. And um, thank you all, Colleen, Patty, and Twin, for the wonderful introduction. Um, <clears throat> I uh, so this week we're gonna focus on meal planning, and we're gonna try to put together all the information we discussed last week. Um, and I know it was probably a lot of of information and numbers and um, hopefully things will make more sense this week. We are trying to kind of um, make it more practical. Um, I would like to start the presentation with answering two of the questions that were last time. Um, I kind of feel like I did not answer them um, exactly because I didn't know. There were a couple of uh, questions about race. So one was why race plays a role and the risk factor in CKD. And um, we talked about certain um, um, certain population like African Americans, Native Americans, and Latinos that are higher risk for CKD. Um, and I'll talk uh, separate about Asian Americans too. Uh, <clears throat> but it, it can, I mean, it looks like there's a hereditary component, but also um, the access to, um, to healthcare plays an important role because there's a high percentage of, um, of people within those categories that won't, um, won't know that they have chronic kidney disease until kind of advanced, more advanced stages. 
Um, so, so there is a component definitely of less access to healthcare. Um, National Kidney Foundation is a wonderful resource and I use it to kind of do more reading and um, they have some statistics around, um, you know, it's a higher percentage of, of people within those populations that um, um, are uninsured, you know, they don't have medical insurance. So, um, so that's, that's part of the, of the risk factor, not just hereditary, which I said that sometimes just certain races are more predisposed to certain diseases, but there's this component too on top of, and again, access to maybe healthy foods too. Um, another question somebody asked um, was about uh, rates in the Asian Americans, rates of diabetes, high blood pressure, CKD. And again, um, kidney.org um, has some data about that. Um, from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, they show that uh, Asian Americans are 18% um, at higher risk of developing diabetes than, for example, white Americans. And a part of that um, is also the fact that um, actually they noticed that um, with Asian Americans that are embracing more the westernized uh, diet, there's a higher, um, th there's a higher risk than, than Asian Americans that continue eating a traditional diet, Asian diet that we know it's high in fruits and vegetables and fish and um, meat and, and chicken. Uh, usually it's used more as a condiment, so it's not the main ingredient of a meal. So um, there's definitely um, studies that show that with, within Asian American communities that are adopting a westernized diet, there's a higher risk for diabetes. And um, we know diabetes is one of the main risk factors for CKD. Um, hereditary and body composition can actually affect um, this risk too. I was on their website, a description of how um, Asian Americans can develop diabetes at a at a smaller increase in weight compared with, for example, white Americans that sometimes um, if they become very overweight, they might have a high risk for diabetes with Asian Americans, even a, a smaller increase in weight can predispose them uh, to diabetes. Um, so, uh, so those are some, um, um, some uh, extra information that I was able to gather and hopefully um, was able to answer your questions, the two question, questions from last week a little bit better. Um, now we can move on and we can start today's um, third class that has a focus on meal planning. And we're gonna start with um, the recommended diet patterns for CKD. Um, and we have here, um, or different types and that that's all kind of I mean they're all in a way um, um, can merge together but but they're addressing different areas of CKD so one would be a heart healthy diet uh, just because um, people with CKD usually are at higher risk um, to develop cardiovascular disease. So we want a heart healthy diet. But what, what's a heart healthy diet? Well, it is a Mediterranean diet that's focusing on fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and lean meats or fish. Um, there is also a DASH diet that it's, it's a diet that actually can help you lower your blood pressure and that can help um, keeping your heart healthy. So both those Mediterranean and DASH diet, they're basically heart healthy diets. Um, it can be a diabetes friendly diet because again, a lot of people with CKD also have diabetes. So they need to manage their blood sugar and they need to watch their carbohydrates. It's not about not eating the carbohydrates, but kind of choosing the right kinds of carbohydrate and keeping an eye on the portion sizes of carbohydrates with each meal. Again, a Mediterranean diet um, can actually help you managing your diabetes because 
as I mentioned to you, um, and when we talked about my plate, and you'll have a picture today, you'll see that, um, actually I want to go there, um, you'll see that half of your plate right here, it's made out of non-starchy vegetables. And then the other half of the plate, it's split between protein and starches. <clears throat> so with this model of eating that's, that's following the Mediterranean diet pattern, you could see that three quarter of the plate, it's plant-based, only one quarter of a plate, it's animal-based. And then again, half of that plate is non-starchy vegetables that are pretty much low in carbohydrates and grains or starchy vegetables are only on this quarter of a, a plate that's about half a cup cooked. That's basically a handful. Um, so this Mediterranean diet pattern that's more plant-based, um, it's also a wonderful way to control your diabetes and uh, um, lower your blood sugar. So going back into my first, first slide, um, so diabetes friendly diet and a plant based diet, which again, they're all about you may hear different terms, right? A heart healthy diet, you may hear dash diet, you may hear the Mediterranean diet, um, carbohydrate controlled diet or a plant based diet, and they're all kind of about the same what I just showed you with that plate. Um, so I wanted to and when I I like to refer to it more a Mediterranean diet pattern plant-based because of that three quarter of the plate is plant and a quarter of the plate is animal-based. Now the DASH diet, I think we mentioned a little bit last time, it's, it stands for dietary approaches to stop hypertension and was recon um, has been recommended by the National Kidney Foundation because it lowers um, sodium, um, it focuses on increased vegetable and fruit consumption, kind of more potassium in your diet with less sodium in a way to manage better your blood pressure. Again, and that would be at stages that are early on that your potassium is not um, high in your blood um, and you don't need to limit it basically. And um, at early stages where your kidneys are still functioning uh, pretty well to, you know, to um, eliminate the extra potassium and not accumulate potassium in your blood. Um, again, an abundance of fruits and vegetables can help you actually lowering blood pressure and can help you lowering your uh, progression or reducing the risk of, of progression of your um, And then whole grains, lean um, type of animal products that won't give you a lot of saturated fat. So that's the, um, that's the principle of, of DASH diet. And um, I think the only difference between DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet is that um, you're lowering the sodium um, more specifically so you're kind of paying attention you're cooking more from scratch you're trying to use less less um, um can or preserved foods that may be high in sodium and uh, we have here the dash diet recommended for ckd stages one and two um and you have grains again a variety of plant foods grains vegetable fruits and then um, low fat, fat free dairy products, maybe two servings a day, um, meat, poultry, fish, two or less uh, daily servings. And that depends also on um, how much you need to restrict protein, what would be your body weight and what's your uh, amount of grams of protein that um, the way we show last week how to calculate based on your body weight. Some people have a lower budget and some have a little bit of a larger budget. And again, you might squeeze one or two servings of, of, of those uh, meat or chicken or fish uh, type of protein in your diet nuts and seeds, four to five servings per week, um, fats and oils and sweets to try to limit to um, as, as less as possible, especially if you have diabetes and you need to watch your blood sugar. Um, with the grains, I wanna say seven, eight daily servings. It depends on, again, if you have diabetes, if you're exercising, if, you're need, you, if you need to lose weight and, um, um, Again, you might need to eat less servings of grains um, just because they tend to be more caloric and maybe 
could maximize your fruits that are less uh, less caloric. Um, the Mediterranean diet, and this is just an, an example of, so this is um, the majority of time and on a daily basis with each meal, you want to eat a, a variety of fruits and vegetables and whole grain, mostly whole grains, olive oil, legumes, um, those dry beans, right? Nuts and seeds, herbs and spices. Um, then you want to have fish and, and, and seafood at least two times a week, two to four times a week. Um, you want to um, have uh, eggs and poultry with no skin, low fat, non fat cheese and yogurt, um, you know, daily to weekly, smaller portions. And then meat and sweets less often, maybe once or twice a week um, to that kind of frequency. So those are at the top of your pyramid. And um, sharing meals and being physically active is also very important. Um, it's a very important principle of, of the Mediterranean diet lifestyle. We have here drink water mainly and wine in moderation. Part of Mediterranean diet is a glass of red wine with dinner. Um, again, if you don't drink alcohol, you don't need to. Um, this is considered what in moderation and you don't have to have it daily, but a, a, a glass of wine a day, it's part of, um, of a healthy diet pattern under the Mediterranean diet pattern. We have here, um, and I, I put diabetes, my plate recommendation. I mean, this is also for heart health. Um, again, it's for CKD to slow the progression um, for people that are, they need to kind of watch the protein, they need to watch the carbohydrates. Um, I would repeat half of the plate on each side would be non-starchy vegetables. Those can be cooked vegetables, raw salad, um, here you have some raw vegetables, here you have salad, and, and here you have cooked vegetables, and can be a combination, either or, or a combination of, of those half of the plate, and then the other half of the plate would be split in half in between the protein and the starch. Um, again, with the starch, ideally to be a whole grain, something with more fiber, or here can be beans, legumes, maybe peas, corn, winter squashes, um, like banana uh, squash, acorn squash, those orange looking um, squashes. The summer zucchini ones are on the other half of the plate, are non-starchy, but the fall ones are starchy. So those can be, or potatoes or sweet potatoes can be here on this quarter of the plate as, as the starch. Um, and uh, whole grains can be here or fruits you know let's say if you just want to eat your protein with your vegetables and at the end you want to enjoy a fruit cup a fruit salad and that can be the carb for your meal and you might choose to to um uh, replace basically the grain with the fruit or have a little bit of both um and on the quarter plate protein here we advise most of the time to have a lean protein choice like chicken with no skin or fish or shellfish eggs low fat non fat dairy products um and then red meat maybe you know um as, as you as you saw at the top of the pyramid maybe two or three times a week maximum um and try to have lean uh, cuts and lean choices um here in this example you have some um, lean pork uh, grilled um it's part of the pork chop looks like um so those can be a protein i want to mention that sometimes the protein can be a plant-based protein and then you have a hundred percent plant-based protein um, and I would encourage people to do that a uh, few times a week, one, two, a few times a week, depending on how much they, um, how often they want to do it. But here you could choose tofu or tempeh or damami beans, um, or you could do uh, legumes, garbanzo, black beans, and maybe still keep the, the whole uh, grain, maybe brown rice, um, so rice and beans and your vegetables, and that can be 100% um, um, plant-based plate. Um, 
especially for people that won't have too much of a budget for protein based on their body weight. Um, I think choosing a hundred percent plant uh, plate um, would would help you to manage that budget because usually um, beans, for example, in half a cup of beans, you get um, you know you get the same amount of protein as in one ounce of chicken. Uh, which one ounce of chicken is not much would be like a third of my a third of my palm, but you get the same amount of protein in half a cup of cooked beans, which volume wise will be a little bit more. So um, can help you kind of staying in a in a lower protein budget when you choose those plant based protein like nuts and seeds, beans and um, for example quinoa can can serve as both the starch and the protein. Um, and those are all good, uh, good choices. Moving forward, um, so what we know about those plant-based foods, uh, they're not highly processed, um, you know, and they're usually whole foods, what we call whole foods, your, your fruits, your vegetables, your um, whole grains, your legumes, nuts and seeds, and they are high in phytates. And what are those phytates? They're natural compounds that can bind different things in our body and they can bind phosphorus, which again, some people um, need to lower their phosphorus um, with more advanced kidney, kidney, um, stages uh, because their kidneys are having a, a hard time to eliminate the phosphorus in their body. So you, um, you know, the, 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 the foods that are naturally high in phosphorus, like beans and nuts and seeds, they're also high in those phytates. And they, they've been shown that um, it's harder to absorb phosphorus in those foods, beans and nuts, uh, because those phytates will, absorb, will bind them and will kind of flush them out of your body, um, basically will uh, make the absorption harder in your blood, so you're not getting all that phosphorus in your blood. Um, you absorb the phosphorus much easier from um, highly processed foods or from the dairy uh, foods, dairy-based foods like cheese and milk. But from beans and nuts, it's harder to absorb that phosphorus because of those fighting. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of reading a nutrition label, and that's regardless of CKD or not. Um, I think the nutrition label is something we have available with any food that it's packaged, right? And it's there for us to actually help us make um, healthier and better choices. And it's important to know how to, um, how to read it. I usually say, um, I like to advise everybody to kind of start at the top and look at the serving size. Like even before you read any number, I know sometimes we look for sodium or we look for fat or we look for carbohydrates if we have diabetes, but try to get into the habit of just glancing at the serving size first. Uh, we don't have, the serving size is not a standardized serving or something that we say, oh, somebody eating this product should eat. It's not a recommended serving. It's, it's what a manufacturer, a manufacturer decides to put as a serving. Again, sometimes the serving size makes sense and it's something that, okay, that sounds like six crackers. That's a good amount. I won't eat more for the snack. But sometimes the serving size is very small and it's not realistic, what I call. Like it's not something that we could actually eat and be satisfied with. And then it's important to glance at that and to know that does this make sense? Would this be an amount that I would eat or not? Because the numbers that are listed um, here on the nutrition label are based only on one serving. And if this, this serving would be one cracker, and I know I would eat six, I would need to multiply everything by six. So kind of looking at the numbers and maybe they look good and they look small, it's not much sodium, it's not much carbohydrate, not much fat, and I didn't look at the nutrition, the, the serving size, that 
uh, that I, I would miss this, the, the, the main point here. You know, I would say this is a good product, but then if I multiply everything by six, would not be a good product anymore. So you need to look at that and, and make sure this makes sense. Once you realize, okay, six crackers, that sounds like a good amount for me, then you could start looking at the numbers. And um, here we have an example because we talk about sodium. You know, sodium is 180 milligrams and then you have 8%. So sometimes the numbers and you see some are grams, some are milligrams. And here in the US, we don't use grams or milligrams. And sometimes it's hard to kind of understand how much is 180 milligrams, you know. Um, and I prefer for certain nutrients to teach people to just use the percentages. And I have this rule of thumb. And if it's 5% or less, that means low in that nutrient. If it's 20% or more, that means high in that nutrient. So for example, when I glance here, sodium 180 milligrams, 8%, it's not five or less, it's not 20 or more. You know, it's closer to five than eight. Eight is closer to five than, than to 20. So it's like, okay, it's not 5% or less, which will translate into low sodium. So it's 8%. That means it's, it's, it's decent. Um, for sodium, we have the 140 milligrams or less, the definition of, of um, low sodium. So we want to choose something that's 140 milligrams or, or less per serving or 5% or less per serving as a way to follow a low sodium diet because in this way we know that by the end of the day we have a better chance to stay within our budget of 2000 milligrams however again if it's if it's too much for you 140 milligrams or less to 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 um to kind of uh, remember the percentages would be easier why it's easier with the percentages that again five percent or less if it's here by saturated fat, which is 5%, that means it's low saturated fat. So that means it's low in that kind of fat that's solid at room temperature that more likely will increase my blood cholesterol. And again, um, if I look here at the dietary fiber and I see 5% less or less, I would translate that into low fiber, which won't be that ideal because Usually for fiber, we want more fiber. We want 20% or more that will translate into high fiber. Um, so at least for certain nutrients like saturated fat that comes in grams, sodium that comes in milligrams or fiber that comes in grams, you could use the percentages and remember the rule of 5% or less means low, 20% or more means high. And you want low for saturated fat and sodium and you want high for fiber. Um, I wanna go here um, for a minute. There's the, I have this slide that just to kind of maybe visually it's easier to, uh, to remember five or less, low, 20%, high. And again, that can be for sodium, that can be for saturated fat or um, fiber less than 140 milligrams sodium translates into low sodium if it's easier for you to work with milligrams and you keep track of those milligrams to reach your budget of 2000. Um, and ingredients that have sodium will have salt, sodium or soda as part of their name. And we have here some examples. Um, so a lot of times under the ingredient list, you'll see things like salt, garlic salt, onion salt, celery salt, or meat tender, uh, tenderizer, flavor enhancers. Those all kind of be um, um, salt and salt seasonings. Sauces that are high in, in, in sodium are teriyaki sauce, oyster sauce, soy sauce and then cure foods, um, anything that's kind of pickled or cured, um, prepared with a lot of salt, um, olives, for example, those are high in sodium. And then canned foods like soups and juices and vegetables. Um, and you have here some alternatives to, to those um, and how to kind of use less Salt, salt overall and sodium overall in your diet, but still in enjoying the flavors and the, um, um, the taste. Uh, lemon, it's a very nice um, 
um, kind of adding an acid like lemon or or vinegar um, can help with the with the flavor. Uh, for the marinades, you can make your own at home. Um, I mentioned that you know if you put some fat, olive oil, some acid, um, either lemon juice or vinegar or tartar sauce, um, and then you put any kind of herbs and flavorings that you want, herbs and spices in a in a Ziploc bag with a piece of of chicken or meat, and and you let it, let it sit for about two hours. You can create your own marinade and tenderize that meat without having to buy something that's already made for you with uh, with lots of sodium. Um, kind of um, what I want to <clears throat> emphasize here: the nutrition label. Um, is actually to try to read the ingredient list too all the time kind of glance and what's in your food um, here we have whole wheat soybean uh, palm oil and salt um, so there are some crackers that um, have that as ingredients and again for example, a cracker that would be higher in sodium would also be a cracker that has baking soda in it and uh, not just salt as an ingredient, but baking soda or um, let's say maybe some onion salt or other flavorings with, with salt that would add even more sodium to that particular cracker. Um, in terms of with the nutrition label, one thing that I want to mention, because again, a lot of people with CKD may have diabetes, is that it's important to glance at the total carbohydrate, and that's 19 grams uh, for this particular six crackers. So uh, for diabetics, we say most of them, when they're trying to control their blood sugar, of course, it depends on your medication regimen, if you're insulin or not, but most people kind of want to follow a pattern of 45 grams of carbohydrate per each meal, each main meal, breakfast 45 grams, lunch 45 grams, dinner 45 grams. And um, so those crackers, for example, when you have that budget that you keep track of, you know, when you eat six crackers, you're going to get 19 grams out of your 45 budget within those six crackers. Then dietary fiber and sugars that are listed separate under the total carbohydrate are included. So those grams zero and three are included in this total 19. It's just the more like further details for people to know how much fiber out of the 19 gram will be, um, will be um, part of this carbohydrate. Fiber is something we don't digest, ends up in your colon. So it's not a kind of, carbohydrate that we could turn into blood sugar because it ends up usually in your colon undigested. Um, so three grams, the more the better. That's why it's better. It's like more out of that budget of carbohydrate to be fiber. And it's good for our health to have more fiber. So three grams, the definition of high fiber, remember I said it's 20% or more, that starts at five grams. So five grams or more would be ideal per serving, but three grams would be better than zero for sure. Uh, there are some crackers that would have zero grams. They're completely refined um, and processed. Uh, and sugars, zero grams. And of course, with sugars, we won't have a percentage. So here, sugars would be zero grams. That means there's no added sugar, no simple sugar in those crackers, which is perfect. That's what we want, especially if you, uh, you know, sugar can be in a chocolate or a dessert, but should not be in a cracker that doesn't taste sweet. Um, and um, usually we can double check there's no sugar ingredient on the ingredient list and there's zero grams so that's perfect however let's say if there was four grams of sugar listed um under sugars how much is four grams again we don't know the grams and we don't know visually how much that is well four grams of sugar equals a teaspoon of sugar so that's the equivalent if you found their sugars four grams you divide the number by four and you get one teaspoon. Let's say if you have a product with 24 grams of sugar, you divide that by four and you get the number of teaspoons. And in this case would be six teaspoons of sugar. 
So this is how you know how much sugar, because again, you can use the percentage rule of thumb, 5% or less, 20% or more. Um, and with sugars, we usually divide that sugar number by four grams and we get the number of teaspoons. And then again, if you watch your protein and you're trying a low protein diet, you're staying within a budget, you know, those six crackers will also give you three grams of protein. I'll try to move forward. Um, and I'm gonna answer any question about reading the nutrition label at the end. We covered this about sodium. I'm oh, sorry, I'm keep going um, backwards. So I have an example here of um, ingredient list because it's good to check those. So we have potatoes, soybean oil, whey, uh, whey um, which is one of the milk protein, salt, dry milk solids, garlic, salt, butter, monosodium glut glutamate, dried oregano, sodium citrate, artificial flavors. So that's a product. We don't know what it is, but those are the ingredient list. And I want to point out the ones that will add sodium. So this probably it's quite high in sodium per serving. It's a more processed food. And the sodium will come from the salt, from the garlic salt, from the monosodium glutamate, and from the sodium citrate. So any kind of sodium and salt names in an ingredient list will signal salt and will add to that sodium number. Um, with phosphorus, if you need to watch phosphorus, um, let's say you're on a phosphate uh, binder, um, you're phosphorus levels are high, your doctor told you you need to watch your phosphorus from your diet too. You need to read the nutrition labels and try to avoid those PO4, which um, um, uh, would be phosphorus additives. So anything that will have this word phos in their names, like the calcium phosphate, the sodium phosphate, monocalcium phosphate, monosodium phosphate, there's so many food additives that will contain phosphate. And even at earlier stages, I mean, if you are stage three to four, and let's say your, so your phosphorus level is still good, I would still try to avoid those phosphate additives. Those are um, easier to absorb in our body. Remember I said nuts and beans, because of phytates, um, we don't absorb that phosphorus that, that well, but with those additives, we absorb quite, quite well. And, um, you know, by doing that, it's, it's, it's definitely, um, that means you're eating a less processed food type of diet, you eat more whole foods. So even at, at levels of uh, when my phosphorus is not high, um, I would consider cutting out on those um, phosphate additives. Now, I would like to go a little bit more into portion sizes and how much would be visually, you know, an ounce of cheese you have here, example, like an ounce, an ounce, an ounce, an ounce, how for different cheeses and different shapes, how much is an ounce of cheese? And in an ounce of cheese, what's important, because last time we talked about grams of protein, we talked about milligrams of sodium, milligrams of potassium, milligrams of phosphorus, and Again, in different foods, you have different concentrations of those, you know. Um, so I wanted to give you some examples and hopefully help you look at the whole picture. So one ounce of cheese would give you about seven grams of protein. And sodium will depend, can be any time, anywhere between 180 to 480 milligrams per ounce, depending on the type of cheese. And um, they're gonna be, you know, uh, cheese, like for example, I can tell you cheddar cheese, it's usually more the 180, so not super high in salt. But let's say something like Parmesan cheese, feta cheese is around 300. So there are cheeses that are saltier than others. Um, and, uh, but in general, as you could see, any hard cheese, even cheddar 180, definitely um, are on the higher side of sodium. So just the process of making cheese um, <clears throat> will concentrate more the sodium and will make the cheese higher sodium. 
Potassium is the cheese is not that high in potassium, so a variety of cheeses will be somewhere around less than 50 milligrams. So it's not uh, one of the high potassium foods. And with the phosphorus, it's about 120 or to 250, again, depending on the kind. Um, some cheeses may have even more than 300 milligrams, some may have less than 100, but this is usually important only if, again, um, you have to uh, monitor and lower your phosphorus in your diet because your doctor told you that in your labs are, are too high. Um, <clears throat> but overall, um, I think what's important for most of, of the CKD at any stage would be to know how much protein and how much sodium you get in an ounce of cheese. And this is how an ounce of cheese looks like. I would say uh, part of a healthy diet, uh, definitely no more than an ounce of cheese a day. And even that maybe not daily necessary, depending on, on your dietary patterns. Moving forward, um, I have a, I want to, as I said, give you some portions, sizes, examples of different foods. So this is the three ounce of chicken, which is the size and the thickness of a deck of cards or the size and the thickness of your palm with no fingers. Um, I know some people have bigger palms than others, but that's why I usually include the deck of cards too. So you have a, a better visual of how thick and how big that, um, that, that portion is. With in three ounce of chicken or, yeah, we specifically, we looked at chicken here. Um, there's about 21 grams of protein. So remember last time I gave you an example of how to calculate uh, based on body weight, um, uh, a protein on a low protein diet. And we came up with a 43 grams a day diet uh, for protein. So that's about half of, of, of that um, amount, the 21 grams. Then sodium, it's about 63 milligrams if cooked with no salt, just kind of naturally occurring sodium in chicken. Um, so it's definitely low sodium. Of course, when you cook, you might add a little bit. Uh, again, you might add other herbs and spices or maybe make a marinade to increase the, enhance the flavor and make the chicken juicier. And in that you could add a little bit of salt, but not too much. And then, and that can still be under 140 milligrams for that three ounce. So it can be a low sodium even when you add a little bit for flavor. Potassium, um, it's about 215 milligrams and phosphorus about 190 milligrams. Um, and again, um, it's something that can be, can fit even for people that need to watch potassium and phosphorus and they need to stick with their budget. Um, uh, they could still include um, and um, have the chicken part of, of that budget. Half a cup of cooked beans. Again, if we wanna talk about legumes and more plant-based types of protein, in half a cup of cooked beans, and that's about the size of your fist, um, you have about seven grams of protein. You could see that size-wise, it might be equivalent with the deck of cards, but uh, protein-wise, it's about three times less. You have sodium zero milligrams if cooked without salt or you get a non-salt um, added kind of canned beans. There are plenty of brands that are offering no salt added option. And again, you could use um, seasoning and um, you could, I always say, try to buy the non-salt added can of beans um, because even when you, I mean, you may add a little bit of salt for the taste, but then you have to control how much to add it. Um, potassium, it's about 300 to 475 milligrams, depending on the beans, and phosphorus, it's about 100 to 140. Remember that phosphorus is not very well absorbed because of phytates, but um, still can consume some of your budget if you're watching phosphorus and potassium. Another one that I wanted to show you is an ounce of nuts, uh, which will kind of be a quarter of a cup. Usually it's about this amount um, here at the a handful, what we call a handful. And for different nuts, depending on the size, I mean, 
not that you need to count, but for example, there might be just six to eight Brazil nuts because those are larger nuts, or if they're almonds, can be somewhere between 20 to 24. So that's about a, a handful, or if you have measuring, um, household measuring um, cups, you could use a quarter of a cup and scoop your nuts, and, and you know that's, um, that's a serving. And in that, you get about seven grams of protein, you get zero to three milligrams of sodium if those are not salted type of nuts. Um, I know some uh, some brands, they have lightly salted or salted. And then um, potassium about 125 to 300 milligrams, depending on the nuts. I think um, um, usually walnuts and pecans are on the lower side though 125 and the 300 ones tend to be um things like um, peanuts and pistachios and, and cashews phosphorus 100 130 milligrams so it's about the same as beans. it's in that range so i hope the um, the sizes and, and the amount of those nutrients of concern for CKD help to put things a little bit more into perspective. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about why is meal planning important for people with CKD. Um, I mean, we know that diet has been shown to help with slowing the progression and it's important to follow a healthy diet to protect your kidneys. but um, why meal planning is important is because um, you, when you plan meals ahead of time, and I talk about that with my uh, weight management clients too, people that try to lose weight um, or they need to control their diabetes. It's like when you plan ahead of time, you're more likely to make better choices. When meals are more predictable, time-wise, you know when you eat, know what you eat because you already maybe brought your lunch with you or cooked the night before or pre-cooked on a Sunday and now you just need to in 15 minutes put things together um, the meal predictability releases a lot of stress and pressure around food because you know what you have you know you thought about it you plan for it you know you you're more likely to make better choices when we make um when we decide what to eat when we're very hungry and um we need to eat right now we're not gonna make good choices because our brain craves more carbohydrate more high fat um type of foods um again we might not have time to make um you know to add some vegetables to that meal so we just kind of make a sandwich and eat it so definitely it's more likely to make better choices and eat healthier when you plan ahead. Of course, when you, uh, you do meal planning, you have more control over what you're putting in your food, right? When you cook more at home, when you put things together, even store-bought things, um, you have more control what's in it. And you know, and you can control the portion of certain things that go inside your dish as opposed to when you buy something and tends to be a larger portion to begin with. Um, so you control the portion of the food that you eat and also you control the portion of each ingredient that you add to your food. And um, so, so that those are important things to, to consider. And um, I know sometimes not everybody feels comfortable in the kitchen. And I always say, try to try to start with small things and simple things. And healthy eating or healthy meals do not have to be complicated or elaborate or very sophisticated. It can be very simple and can be very delicious too. So try to start with, with small steps and kind of build on um, as you build your confidence in the kitchen. I've worked with some people that I have to say, um, I was able to kind of witness their, their, um, uh, how they increased their ability to cook and how they became more confident. And it's a nice feeling that comes with that because 
all of a sudden it's like, oh, I can make something that's actually good and other people may enjoy it and say, oh my God, this is so tasty and appreciate my food. And also, you know, it's good for your body and you made it and you don't depend on anybody else for that meal. Um, the first steps to plan, um, planning a kidney friendly diet. Um, so you need to have a regular grocery shopping day at least once a week, you know, some people prefer to do it more often, sometimes less often, but it's kind of tricky, especially with fresh produce. If you do it every other week, I would say at least once a week, you, you should plan to kind of have a designated day for grocery shopping. What you bring in the home, this is what you're going to eat. So you need to have that day where you bring things and you have them on hand so you could actually cook healthy meals. Um, and how to do that is like, well, if you decide that day is, I don't know, Saturday, for example, then maybe by Friday you can glance and look what's already in the house. What do I have still from last week or what do I have on hand? What do I need to buy? Um, you can ask if you have family members that, um, you cook for or you eat with, um, ask them for ideas. What do you want to eat this week? What should we have? What we maybe haven't had in a long time. Um, you know, you have to be realistic about your time, pre-cooked versus raw food versus leftover. Maybe you, most people don't have time to, to buy everything from scratch, you know? And again, you might compromise and you might use for a, for a dish uh, canned beans and you get the no, no salt added ones and that's fine, you know, that's a healthy option. Um, and um, kind of trying to figure out what, what's realistic for you and and um and your family to do in terms of cooking again not everybody has the luxury to have a lot of hours to spend in the kitchen nowadays even when we're mostly at home it's still challenging for a lot of us um reuse items for multiple meals i say well you bake let's say a lot of chicken and you might need to watch the protein but that chicken you could use it in different ways um for three, four consecutive meals, you know, you can make a wrap with it, you could put it on a salad, you could make um, 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 maybe uh, add some um, pesto sauce to it and put it in a sandwich, you know, um, cut up leftover chicken. So reuse items for multiple meals. You don't have to just cook. And, and leftovers are great, actually, because it shows you, well, you don't have to cook for every single meal. You save time. And once you cook one, one, uh, one night, um, you might have maybe another day of, of eating without having to cook the next day. Um, here, there's the idea of dry batch cooking, freezing extras. You know, sometimes if we make too much or we have a small family of one or two people only, um, even when you, I mean, how many leftovers can you eat? You eat that thing over and over again, but you might actually freeze half of it. And then in two weeks or three weeks, you revisit that dish and you, you get it out of the freezer. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, having a list, if you need to lower to, again, watch your potassium and phosphorus, kind of having the list that I sent you last week um, uh, with the high and, and the low ones to kind of know which ones to not have very often and which ones to have more often would be helpful. And uh, again, read the nutrition label. That's very important when you, when you shop and you plan. Um, that's there for us to look at it. And I know a lot of people don't look and, and they buy a product and they might see later on, oh my God, this is so high in sodium or oh my God, this is so high in sugar. I did not expect this mac and cheese to be high in sugar or this um, ketchup. There's so many products that we won't expect necessarily to see certain nutrients in. Um, I have here a weekly meal plan. And again, some people prefer to do that by hand because it kind of keeps them stay on track. Some do that mentally. Um, they already think about three, four meals that they want to make in a week and they help them generate a grocery shopping list. And then, you know, they cook those meals throughout the week whenever they, they feel like. Um, 
But what I wanted to say, um, the good news is that I mean, I admit the seven day menu can be overwhelming to come up with seven uh, meals for breakfast, seven for lunch, seven for dinner. But the reality is like for breakfast, you need probably two options and then most people are okay with eating the same thing and having just a little bit, a little bit of variety for breakfast. And then with lunch and dinner, I always say, if you plan Monday, Wednesday, Friday, make enough for leftovers, then you'll week will can be almost full and i have an example here right that you could um you could uh, try um so you know there are those um three days monday wednesday fridays that are kind of filled and i bought ingredients for and then for tuesday and thursday um and Saturday, for example, I can use the leftovers and kind of alternate those. And maybe Sunday I take out. Um, so that's an example of how to make it more manageable, especially if you feel that it's a little bit too overwhelming, you're not used with it. Um, there, if you are already doing that, then you could add the challenge to say, hey, let's figure out maybe five, um, five days a week instead of three and then leave the weekends, the two days um, in a weekend, uh, just kind of open to, to figure out what to do. Um, these are, I have like a shopping list here idea. So when you have a, um, the site. so when you have this um, weekly meal plan, <clears throat> with those foods that are listed here, then the shopping list you generate. So I need four fruits, apples, berries, grapes, and avocado. I need some vegetables, zucchini, broccoli, peppers, onions, celery, basil, lettuce, cucumber. So kind of look at the ingredients that you need to cook those um, meals. And, and that's how you come up with your ingredient list, with your shopping list, sorry. And here we have some uh, ideas of breakfast, uh, for example. And you'll see those pictures, I mean, some of them, especially when it comes to protein, they're, uh, it's very hard to find online pictures that are portion control for protein for CKD. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of examples are just having much more protein that, um, that I was telling you to eat. So those are some egg muffins uh, with some vegetables, kind of like a, like a um, frittata muffin type of thing. This is an avocado toast with some hard boiled egg and uh, on a whole wheat uh, bread. This is oatmeal with um, a little bit of dry fruit, um, looks like dry, ra maybe raisins and uh, some nuts, walnuts. And uh, just some fruit that can accompany um, any, any of the meals. So you can have some fruit with the egg muffins, you can have some fruit with your avocado to toast and you can have some extra fruit with your oatmeal. Hmm. Um, for lunch, lunch ideas, so you can have a pasta dish. I think those are some scallops, so some seafood. Again, what's nice about seafood, they're smaller pieces and you could kind of, um, and I, I would advise to do that with chicken and meat when you have only maybe two ounces uh, for your budget for that meal, meal, meal to eat in terms of protein. If you make it, if you cut it in smaller pieces and kind of spread it on a, on a salad or on a pasta dish, I know you, you, you can have with every single bite some protein, some chicken flavor or some pork or some, in this case, we have scallops. So we have some pasta, we have some vegetables, looks like carrots and broccoli, and then some protein. Um, like this salad definitely has more than three ounces of protein here. and. Um, I would say something like that, besides the leafy greens and the fruit and the onion, you could put some radishes, bell peppers, cucumbers, and then again, chop up maybe two or three, depending on your budget for protein, of those chicken slices into smaller cubes and spread them on your salad. Um, this is a minestrone soup with vegetables and some corn and um, 
and the meatballs, which again, when you look all together, they're about seven meatballs. They're not too big, but probably um, probably about four to six of them can be that three ounce depending on the size, but I would estimate, let's say, would say six of them would be the three ounce. What you could do to stay within, um, with the meatballs especially, um, what I like to recommend is that you can make them smaller. And also when you make the meatballs, you can mix into the ground meat um, or ground turkey, things like in a food processor, you could put some onions, some carrots, some mushrooms, and then um, you blend everything. So it becomes kind of ground and, and uh, more pasty, and then you mix it with the, with the protein. And now in a two to three ounce of protein, um, when you add those vegetables, um, you could come up with more meatballs, right? You kind of stretch those meatballs so they're not as high in protein, but you have um, in your plate more than four maybe meatballs. And then we have this ground beef with vegetables in the pita, po uh, pita pocket. So uh, that can be like a stir fry vegetable with again, uh, some beef for flavoring, not too much. And uh, you could stuff those whole with pita pockets with it. Um, dinner ideas, we have again, turkey meatballs with herb pasta and it's the same concept with the minestrone soup. Um, some salmon, it's about half of what you see here. It's about that deck of cards. That can be even a salad with some cucumber sauce, um, tzatziki sauce on the side, um, can be maybe um, some brown rice with it and more cooked vegetables, depending on how you want to eat it. This is a um, broccoli beef stir fry bowl. Um, with this, I would say uh, definitely the image shows quite a bit of rice and quite a bit of beef. Um, portion size, if we look at my plate, what I showed you, uh, we need probably the beef to. Uh, slice it more th uh, uh, the slices of beef to be on a thinner side um, you could add I would definitely add more vegetables more broccoli um, and then uh, the rice um, if you're diabetic and you need to control uh, your carbohydrate you could go up to a full cup which would be this amount um, of rice and you could put the vegetables and the and the beef um what i'd like to mention definitely brown rice would be or wild rice would be a high fiber better choice for that starch but if uh, this is a dish that um you know um, you like it with white rice and um, um you could have white rice i think what's important with that is to definitely uh, put more vegetables in that so then you get some extra fiber from the vegetables so then the white um the white rice won't spike your blood sugar as much so you eat it with extra fiber from extra vegetables so i would definitely cut the amount of white rice in this case and and maybe keep it under a cup put more vegetables and some beef and and this would be kind of the compromise to to have a dish like that and then here the last one would be a burrito bowl we have some beans we have some um vegetables a little bit of cheese um avocado salsa and i think this is i don't know it looks like a it doesn't look like rice it looks more like couscous to me but it can be definitely uh, some grain maybe four of a cup or third of a cup um since beans are also starchy and uh, those are some uh, some meal ideas that can be more CKD friendly snacks, celery with some cream cheese. Uh, cream cheese, even for people that are, um, so cream cheese is one of the cheeses that is low in phosphorus and that's why you're gonna hear about it as, as um, more CKD friendly. Again, if you don't need to really 
watch your phosphorus, I would probably better have here peanut butter um, or almond butter with the celery. I think those are healthier fats. We have some zucchini bread. Um, walnuts and tuna and cucumber that can be um, a snack, a tuna salad on cucumber. Um, and that also depends on what's your budget for protein. Um, fruits are always good choices. Um, for example, with those walnuts, I would get an ounce of walnuts and then a piece of fruit, maybe baseball size of, of orange, peach, or apple, or a cup of berries with that uh, quarter cup of nuts. That always seems to be a, a good healthy snack. If you have diabetes, you have CKD. Or I have here some recipe resources, but um, I think we're open to take more questions and clarify things that maybe were not as clear. Hi, Elena. The first question is, what do you recommend for someone on a budget? This person cannot buy fresh food all the time. Definitely on a budget, I, I would get more, um, you know, canned beans, the way I said, no salt added beans, um, like almond butter, peanut butter, those are good for snack um, or for breakfast, even with a piece of with bread and some some fruits you could add um, if, if it's hard to buy fresh produce uh, you could use some um, canned fruits um, I would get the ones in um, in uh, in their own juice so with no no heavy or um, no syrup basically no sugar added so the ones in their own juice uh, would have just the sugar from the fruits, um, so no sugar added in that syrup that's uh, that's canned. So um, and you could use those maybe a snack as part of your breakfast. If if again uh, fresh fruits won't be um, uh, accessible for you. Um, I mean there are. I, I, and I have to say there's a lot of variety with fruits too. I mean, some fruits are very expensive too, like cherries and berries and, and things that are in season for a limited time usually tend to be more expensive. But I would say, you know, apples are good too and bananas and those are more affordable and they're year round and those can be good foods and good fruits to have on hand. And also they last longer too. Um, they're not as perishable, let's say, as berries or cherries or um, or peaches. Um, and again, the ones that are in season tend to be um, that they have more limited season um, into into the year. Uh, they tend to be more expensive. Or pomegranate, there's they're usually pomegranate. They're they're expensive, but you could stick with the with the cheaper fruits and the the ones that also last longer. And you could do a combination of canned and, and fresh. Um, the same with vegetables, um, you know, you could get frozen vegetables, you can get uh, canned vegetables with no salt added, like green beans and beets and things like that that can, can come, not all vegetables will come in a, in a can form, but some will and they're more affordable. Um, and again, I recommend to do a combination of those um, based on your budget and uh, what you can, uh, what you can afford. Eggs are good, cheap type of protein that you, it's nice to have on hand and they're pretty good for us. Um, even for cholesterol, we say, you know, one egg a day, it's, a, it's moderate intake and uh, should not increase your blood cholesterol. So I hope some of the suggestions will, uh, will make sense for you. Thank you, Elena. These next two questions I think can be answered at the same time. One of the questions asks, uh, or one of the questions is, this person is vegetarian, they have stage three CKD, they're looking for recommendations for protein. And a second question that is also similar to this is, can you please show some recommendations that are totally vegetarian? 
by answering the first question with stage three recommendations for protein. So would be in that, in, in terms of, first of all, how much protein, right? You need to establish your budget. So you get your body weight in, in pounds and you divide that by 2.2 and you get the number of kilograms, um, the amount in kilograms, and you multiply that by 0 0.55, and then you multiply that by 0 0.6. So somewhere between 0 0.55 to 0 0.6 grams of protein per kilogram body weight would be what you aim for your total, um, total protein budget for the day. And now how you use that as a vegetarian, so you could use things like eggs um you could use things like tofu beans any kind of legumes dry beans right um nuts and seeds will be into that um, um will kind of be the type of protein to use your budget so for example you could have for breakfast um some oatmeal with walnuts um and a hard boiled egg for example right if you want uh, or you could have a toast of of bread with some almond or peanut butter or any kind of nut butter and some fruit and uh, maybe some Greek yogurt, maybe a third of a cup of Greek yogurt with that slice of um, bread and nut butter. Then for lunch and dinner, again, your protein can be um, um, Let's say for lunch, if you like a salad, you could have a salad with the hard boiled egg. If it's if you didn't have that for breakfast, the egg, you know, you could have it for lunch. Let's say you had the yogurt, um, a little bit of yogurt and the nut butter, right? And then for, for lunch, you can have a salad with hard boiled egg and um, maybe a little bit of um, shredded cheese if you want, or, um, and a bunch of leafy greens and vegetables and, and some avocado. Um, and then for dinner, you could have some um, lentils uh, with some quinoa and, and vegetables, you know, um, you can have them separate or cook together, or you could have um, um, maybe some rice, brown rice with some tofu and some vegetables. And again, the amount, remember, of if you have a budget of 40, um, 45 uh, grams of protein, you know, that's roughly about 15 grams of protein per each main meal, right? So, um, um, based on, um, on the handouts I'll show you and the portions I show you, that's, let's say, a cup of cooked lentils with um, um, a half a cup of cooked lentils with half a cup of, of rice and some vegetables that can be something close to 15 not even um, again when you use the egg with a little bit of cheese that can be up to 15 or let's say in the in the salad you put some hard boiled egg and maybe um, half a cup of cooked beans and uh, canned beans no salt added and, and then your salad that's about 14 grams of protein only um, so you stay within your budget of an average of 15 grams of protein per main meal if your budget would be 45 a, a day so those are your sources of, of vegetarian um, um, protein the next question is asking if you could go over um, these serving, sorry, I'm misreading. Can you go over again, what is the serving of the items you listed for the DASH diet slide? So, grains, seven, eight daily servings. Again, I feel that's a little bit too much uh, for a majority of people that want to lose weight or they have diabetes. Um, but I mean, a serving, it's usually a third of a cup cooked. So let's say in a full cup of, 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 of cooked rice, you have three servings already. So the servings are pretty small, but um, still you might, um, you might need sometimes to limit to four to five if you're trying to lose weight or control your diabetes, depending on the case. Vegetables, definitely four or five serving daily, or I like to say five plus. If you can eat more, you could. 
four to five would be to aim for fruits, four or five uh, daily servings. Again, if you're diabetic, you might stick more with three, four, and the idea is to spread them throughout the day. So not have all those servings in one sitting, you know. Um, I gave you an example, baseball or apple, orange, that's about a serving. So you wanna have those three, four servings spread throughout the day, not all at once, because they can increase your blood sugar. Uh, low fat, fat free daily products, two to three daily servings. Again, somebody that needs to wash their phosphorus, um, more late stages that can be more, maybe only one serving a day, one maximum two, but um, for some bad stages, uh, early stages, two to three, it's fine. Um, meat, poultry, and fish, two or less daily servings, again, depending on your uh, amount for protein. Uh, nuts, seeds, four or five servings per week. Fat and oils, two, three daily servings. Um, and then sweets, try to limit um, as much as possible. Less than five servings a week. Thanks, Elena. We can fit in maybe one more question, if that's okay. Yeah, I think we can take the one with the... Uh, um, does the type of protein matter, especially in case of portioning with my um, portioning with my plate? Uh, exam example, steak versus chicken. And I would say yes. And as I mentioned in that my plate image, um, chicken. You know, most of the time, try to get lean protein like um, fish, shellfish, poultry with no skin. Um, you know, plant-based protein like tofu, beans, or low-fat, non-fat dairy products, and the red meat like steak. I would uh, limit it, even when you eat only a quarter of a plate, I would still eat, limit it to um, maybe two, three times maximum a week. Um, remember red meat was at the top of the Mediterranean diet. Um, as much as the saturated fat or the fat, there's other components in red meat that increase risk. Heart disease or diabetes actually make you less insulin sensitive. Um, so it's something that we don't want to have in majority of cases as choices. I would say keep it more for a special occasion, twice a week, something like that. If you really like red meat twice a week, I think it's doable. Elena, should we start the quiz now? Yeah. All right. You'll see that there are three questions. Feel free to take your time. Okay. So the first question, what is the healthy dietary pattern for slowing the progression of CKD? Elena, what's your answer? So it's the Mediterranean diet with low protein and it looks like that's what most people kind of answer. So yep. plant-based with less protein. Great. Next, what are the main risk factors of CKD? Yeah, we have a split here, but I think uh, we tricked you a little bit, but it's A and B only, right? Diabetes and high blood pressure, those are your main uh, risks. So A and B were um, 25% and some people kind of responded diabetes, high blood pressure. Um, so A, A and B would have been the correct one. Oh, okay. <laughs> A and B only. <laughs> Next, uh, last question. What does 140 milligrams of sodium or less per serving mean? Um, so that means low sodium. Oh. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone, for participating in our mini quiz. Um, again, this is hosted by Community Health Resource Center with the help of National Kidney Foundation. Without them, this program wouldn't have been possible. And of course, without our registered dietitian, Elena, this, uh, this three-part class wouldn't have happened either. So I'd like to appreciate um, Patty, Elena, Colleen, everyone for having a hand in creating this class, making it open to the public. Elena, Patty, is there anything that, or Colleen, is there anything that you guys like to add before we sign off? Sorry. Um, no, I think it was great. Thank you so much, um, Elena and Twin, for making this possible and for all the attendees on the line. Um, you know how to get a hold of us with further questions. We really appreciate okay. it. And we have three questions that I did not answer, didn't get the chance to go, get through, and uh, we'll definitely I'll include my uh, my answers, um, and I'll send you send it to you, Twin. 
Yes, all attendees who entered the room today will, or entered the virtual room will receive an, a post presentation email. It will include handouts mentioned, uh, the presentation slides, on the evaluation one. link, in case you didn't get a chance to click on it right now in the chat box. It will include the video link and it will include the three answers to the three questions we didn't get to reach to today. Um, but thank you everyone. I will be on a little bit longer just to keep that chat box active and you can click on the link. But thank you so much everyone for coming. We are officially, uh, this class is officially closed.